Hello and welcome to What's New in Historical Fiction. My name is Colin Mustful. I'm the founder and editor of History Through Fiction. Um, this is a regular panel series that I that History Through Fiction puts on, and it features historical novelists with new and upcoming titles. Um, I'm so excited to bring this panel to you today, and I'm so glad that all of you could join us. Um, please take some take a moment, say hello in the chat. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat bubble. Just hit that button and then say hello. Let us know where you're joining us from. Um, let us know if you've read any of the books by our authors today um, or maybe what, you, what you're reading. Um, the event, I'm going to keep things pretty simple. So we'll we'll have the, uh, the panelists introduce themselves. And then I'm going to just uh, ask some questions about their books and about their writing. And then with about 10 or 15 minutes remaining in this hour long program, I'll invite questions from the audience and I'll just have you drop those questions in the chat and then I'll be able to ask those questions to our panelists. Um, I do have one other thing. I have a landing page that I put together with all four of our panelists books and that landing page will show a synopsis of the book. I'm gonna put it in the chat in the chat right now and I'll put it in there a couple of times throughout the event. Um, and also those, they link to bookshop.org, which we support um, purchasing books from bookshop.org because they give a percent of their proceeds back to independent booksellers. And we think it's really important to support ind indie bookstores. Okay, without further ado, uh, let's meet our panelists. Uh, Madeline, if you could uh, let us know about your book and a little bit about yourself. Hey everyone, Madeline Martin. Um, so I write historical fiction, usually set uh, during World War II. Prior to that, I was writing um, historical romance, which I pretty much like went to all the different categories of history at that point um, before starting to write historical fiction. And my book, The Keeper of Hidden Books, uh, comes out on August 1st. And this is um, inspired by the efforts of the public Warsaw librarian or Warsaw's public librarians during the Nazi occupation um, and their efforts to not only save books from Nazi destruction, but also to still keep libraries open and books available to their patrons, um, even when all of the libraries were completely shut down. And um, August 1st is a special date with it coming out because um, that's when the Warsaw Uprising happened. After five years of oppression, that's when the soldiers finally were able, or the, the people were finally able to rise up against the Nazis and fight back. And so even today um, in Warsaw at 5 p.m., which was W hour, on August 1st, the entire city goes completely silent, except for all the sirens and alarms and everything blaring. So um, it's really such an honor to have this book coming out on August 1st. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, next, let's go to Laura Morelli, if you could tell us about your book and a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Laura Morelli. I'm an art historian and historical novelist. Um, I've, written, I've published five books of historical fiction. Some of them take us from the Italian Renaissance to World War II. Um, my new book, which also comes out next Tuesday, August 1st, is The Last Masterpiece, um, my joy in writing historical fiction is always to bring the incredible true stories of art history to life. And the last masterpiece takes us to war-torn Italy between 1943 and 45, when things were very complicated indeed. And so uh, we have an American protagonist and a German protagonist. Both of these women are part of the effort to safeguard priceless works of art that had been hidden uh, throughout the countryside uh, outside of Florence, uh, the Uffizi Galleries, the Bargello, the Pitti Palace, these great collections of some of the world's greatest masterpieces. Um, these collections were hidden in the Tuscan countryside and uh, people on the Italian side, on the German side, on the Allied side, all had a really important role to play in this drama. And it's just an incredible true story. And uh, so I'm really excited to uh, bring it to life and to share it with you starting next week. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I saw there's a couple mess messages in the chat, people having some technical difficulties. I'm not a technical expert. My best suggestion is that you just leave the meeting and come back in and hopefully that fixes things. Um, so yeah, hopefully everything goes well technically, but 
I, I'm not an expert on, on those things. Uh, let's go to Logan. Uh, Logan, if you could tell us about yourself and your novel. Hi, yes, I'm Logan Steiner, and um, I am a uh, litigator, writer, and uh, mother of a two-year-old living in Denver. Um, After Anne is my debut novel, um, and it came out May 30th. It tells the story of um, the creator of Anne of Green Gables, Ellen Montgomery, um, and uh, you know tells her her life story in novel form. A story of you know tremendous determination and success, kind of against the odds. She um, grew up in rural Canada at a time when there were not many women writing, and and certainly not many women who rose to the level of success that she did. Um, suffered you know a lot of loss, lost young, lost her mother at a young age, um, raised by kind of strict and stoic grandparents who not only didn't support her writing, but didn't understand her writing dreams. Um, she persisted through a lot, um, including a lot of rejection, um, and you know became an internationally best-selling and world-famous author. So the novel tells the story of of that um, you know that success, but also, as the title suggests, it talks about what came after Anne, what came after this kind of instant success of Anne of Green Gables, including the difficulty and struggle that can come with success, the impact of success on marriage for women in particular and women in particular at, at that time, um, which unfortunately is something that can you know, still be so true today, um, that struggle with having a public face um, and becoming a public figure and what to make public and keep private once, um, you know, that kind of success has happened. And then also the demands of the readership, um, you know, and, and whether to write for the readers or write for um, yourself as, you know, after that kind of success. So, um, you know, the novel focuses um, on, you know, the kind of behind the scenes private life of, of somebody who publicly seemed to have achieved a lot of what she had dreamed of. Thank you, Logan. Yeah, I definitely want to talk to you more about uh, Lucy Mod Mod Montgomery's life, but um, we'll get into that during the panel. Uh, next, let's bring on Louise. Louise, if you could introduce yourself and tell us about your novels. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Louise Hare, and I have uh, currently two published novels, uh, both historical mysteries, and the third is on the way next month. So my current novel is Miss Aldridge Regrets, um, which is a murder mystery set in the 1930s. And it follows Lena Aldridge, who is a sort of failing jazz singer. who had all these great ambitions of this wonderful career that she was going to have. Uh, and now she's in her mid twenties and it's kind of not worked out the way she hoped. Until one day she gets offered um, this incredible opportunity uh, to have a starring role on Broadway, a first class ticket on the Queen Mary. And it kind of sounds too good to be true, but for various reasons, it seems like a good time for her to leave London and give New York a shot. Um, so she boards the Queen Mary um, and very quickly murders start to happen. And she's not sure what's going on. Is she in danger of becoming the next victim or is she going to fall into suspicion of being the murderer? Um, so it's about her journey. Um, uh, and also how she got to the point um, where she kind of took this opportunity, which definitely sounded very dodgy from the start. Um, and then uh, this is a, an advanced copy of the next book, which follows Lena's adventures after she arrives in New York. Um, it's called Harlem After Midnight, and it's out on August 31st. And that, um, without giving any spoilers for it, either book just sort of follows what happens immediately um, after Lena gets uh, to New York and sort of finds herself living in Harlem. Uh, because one thing I didn't mention earlier is that she's actually mixed race, but passing as white, or she can pass as white. Um, and that's part of the dilemma in the first book. Um, and that continues into the second book. So it's a murder mystery, but it also um, looks at some of the issues around, around race um, for someone like Lena at that time. Louise, I think you're holding out on us a little bit. That's an amazing cover. I have not seen that version of it with the gold lettering. It's so blingy. 
<laughs> you have to like move it so it sparkles. <laughs> Beautiful. It's the advanced copy. I think the final version is going to be slightly different, but I've asked for to keep the gold. Nice. It's beautiful. Well, thank you all so much for telling us about your novels. Um, let's go to Madeline. Uh, Madeline, I'm really intrigued about these librarians in Warsaw and your main character, Zofia. So tell us about Zofia and then and more in general, who were these librarians and, and what did they do during World War II to protect literature? So um, Zofia, the book starts at, it's, it's the book really encompasses the entire um, uh, war in Poland from the very beginning until um, in 1939 when it gets attacked um, all the way through uh, May 1945. There's a reason why that date is super specific, which people will realize once they read the book. Um, but Sophia, basically, um, her and her friends start off at age 17. And uh, the reason why I did that was because um, during the Warsaw Uprising, a lot of the, the people who were participating were between 21 and 22, people who hadn't been sent away to labor camps or who hadn't been soldiers that were now prisoners of war. Um, and then, of course, you also had a lot of people who were like 16 and, uh, and you know, really, really teenagers and even as young as like nine and 10, because the, the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides, um, which were like the Girl Scouts of America today, were the biggest participants of the Warsaw Uprising. Um, so I really didn't want to make her any younger than 17 because I, I, and I love reading YAs, but writing teenagers is a struggle because they're so mercurial. <laughs> So I wanted to make sure I didn't go any younger than that. Um, but with, uh, so Sophia has always been a lover of reading. And um, and whenever I do research for my characters, I always make sure that I don't just research that particular time period. I dig all the way into the history of the country that I'm researching. And um, with Poland, you know, they've had centuries of struggle to have freedom, something that Poland didn't actually have until after the Treaty of Versailles, after the First World War. Um, and so I knew that I wanted her to be sort of like a ferocious character, a little bit rebellious. And I kind of thought to myself, well, if there was going to be this rebellious character, what would she do, especially as a book lover? So there's also a secret book club in this where they read banned books. Um, and that's a huge part of the book as well. And she eventually ends up working at the Warsaw Public Library. And, um, and really so many of these events, like the librarians really were such an integral part of the, of the community and of the culture from the very beginning. When the bombs were falling um, on Warsaw during the attack, and they were hiding books and they were they were salvaging books from, from ruins and from bomb sites um, on into the Nazi occupation when they were being destroyed and they were doing what they could to prevent them from that destruction. Um, even opening up a secret library when all of the libraries were closed and Poles were no longer allowed to read books. And, um, and even on through the Warsaw Uprising, providing a place for people to stay and even building false walls to hide books behind to prevent them from being destroyed even if the Nazis did come and take over um, as far as the library goes. But, um, but then you also had even inside the Warsaw Ghetto, there were people who would have their own personal library that they would have brought from their home that they put into suitcases and would pass around for people to be able to borrow. And, um, and even a child's like orphanage center that had secret shelves that would flip around like a dollhouse would flip around and then there would be Polish and Yiddish books behind it. So um, finding all of this incredible history behind these brave efforts of librarians to try to keep, you know, keep hope alive in such dark times, it really was just such an incredible thing. And, uh, and that's really what this book kind of is about with all of the, the libraries and, and, and the books that really do help them get through everything. Yeah, it's really quite an amazing story, quite an inspiring story, kind of tragic that, that it had to happen, but yeah, it's very fascinating and, and very inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, let's go to you. If you could tell us about the main characters in your novel, The Last Masterpiece, Ava Brunner and Josephine Evans, what did they do and how did you use these characters to teach readers about import these, these important historical events or about art? Yeah, it's so cool to hear you speak about this, Madeline, because the theme of, you know, the power of literature and the arts to bring people hope in times of darkness is also a theme that I 
really um, stay with over the course of my novels having to do with art and wartime. And certainly um, the last masterpiece is really about that. It's about these um, individuals who put themselves at risk and made important decisions that impacted the fate of one of a kind masterpieces that perhaps would not be with us today if it weren't for their bravery and their decisions and their actions. And so, you know, we see people on the Italian side, on the German side, on the allied side, who are all making these really important decisions. And it's really just a small handful of people who we can thank really for the survival of literally millions of works of art, books, um, you know, drawings, sculptures, paintings, all of that, that, that might have been destroyed during World War II if it were not for their efforts. So in the last masterpiece, we have two main characters and they're kind of opposite sides of a coin because they're looking um, at the war from two different sides. So on the Axis side, we have Eva Brunner, who is a, a, a young German photographer who's um, living in Austria. She's living in Aldase, which is, if you know your World War II history, you know that that is a salt mine where about 6,500 works of art were, were hidden um, on behalf of the Nazis. And she's documenting and photographing in the mines. And then on the other side of the ocean, we have Josephine Evans, who comes from very humble circumstances. She's the daughter of a cleaning lady at Yale University. So it's this environment of extreme haves and have nots. And she decides to sign up for the Women's Army Corps. These were the first women who were sent overseas as active duty, inactive duty, um, and not as auxiliary like, had, like nurses had been in the past. Um, they were uh, traveling just behind the front lines and they went up the entire boot of Italy during World War II. It's really a remarkable group of women and a remarkable story. So uh, both Josie and Eva find themselves in Italy at the same time and each woman is, is playing an important role in preserving these works of art. And um, they're doing so on opposite sides. And so that's what really fascinated me about this story was to kind of um, explore all of these gray areas of Italy during between 1943 and 45, because Italy's really one of the most complex um, areas when we talk about World War II, there's there's not a lot of black and white at all. Um, if you remember your history, you remember that Benito Mussolini was allied with um, Adolf Hitler at the beginning of the war. And then in September 1943, the Italians switched sides. So suddenly all of those German troops who were who were in the Italian cities and were kind of frenemies at that time were, became outright enemies overnight. And so it put all of these uh, priceless works of art and monuments in a very complicated and precarious situation. So I really wanted to explore two different sides to that uh, situation. Yeah, I can definitely see how those two are are related. And I see people in the comments saying, you know, there's endless stories about World War II, and we just need to keep mining them out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Logan, let's go to you. Um, you you talked about Lucy Maud Montgomery. Uh, what I'm curious to know, um, the author of Anne of Green Gables, what you know, what inspired you to tell her story, and how did you you know first decide you wanted to look into the who the author was, not just reading about the novel. Yes. Um, so Ellen Montgomery has been a, a favorite author of mine since I was really young. Um, and that really dates back to um, a small town, Iowa, my grandma um, giving me Anne of Green Gables and to read. And I just devoured it and, um, you know, read everything Ellen Montgomery had written, uh, watched the CBC Megan Follow series with my grandma too many times to count. And um, it has such a special um, emotional connection for me. Um, and that character of Anne in particular, um, you know, was an, an inspiration of my dreams to write. But when I think about what really drew me to her, so much of it was, you know, her unfiltered ways. I think that um, there are as many reasons to love Anne as there are <laughs> Anne lovers. Um, and so many things that have made that character so enduring. But for me, it was the you know, she just had, um, she spoke her mind, the young Anne. And I think as somebody who had always 
really struggled with caring so much um, in many cases, too much about what people were thinking, um, just that freedom to kind of be and pursue the dreams in the world. Uh, reading about Anne gave me some of that sense of permission to do more of that. Um, and, you know, in, in writing, choosing to write about the life of a writer, a big part of my motivation was, um, you know, I've had these dreams of writing from a young age and always been really scared of doing just this, this is kind of putting my writing out there in the world. Um, and in exploring, you know, a fellow creative life, not only somebody who did it, but kept doing it and kept, um, you know, overcoming so much um, to, to keep doing it um, in a much kind of harder time and place to write as a woman than now. Um, I really was looking to feel less alone, um, kind of in my fears and struggles and to get that inspiration to keep going. Um, but learning about Ellen Montgomery's story in particular, I was, I was struck immediately, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of Anne in her, there's a lot of the characters that she created in her. And I think that her story is, you know, um, you know, shows what about that kind of way of being can be so attractive, but also so threatening and was in particular so threatening um, to people at the time. And so, so it's sort of the story of what happens when a character like Anne meets the real world with its challenges, with um, you know personal tragedies, so many things beyond our control. Um, and so, just learning kind of a general sketch of what happened in Maud's life, um, and you know, including that she had these journals that were published that are just you know tremendous reads. I was driven to to know and understand her more. I think that's great that you were able to connect with her on that more personal level. That's wonderful. Uh, well, let's go to Louise. Uh, Louise, you already told us a little bit about Lena. Uh, maybe if you could elaborate on how you came up with Lena, how you met her and developed her. Um, I also want to know about historical mystery. Why did you put her in, you know, combine mystery and history and, and how and why did you do that? Um, I think... To answer your second question first, I think it's a little bit quicker for me to answer. Um, I think I'm just fascinated by mystery. It's like a great way to set up a plot. It's sort of an easy way to, to hook a reader. Um, and as part of that, um, Lena sort of came around because I was thinking, okay, what's the idea? And I really like the idea of, a, of someone witnessing a, a murder. And then say you know who did it or you suspect who did it, like what you know what would you do with that information and then once I sort of come up with that idea I started thinking about who, the, who this woman was and I'm always interested with the fact that you know if you see someone performing on a stage or you see a celebrity you have this idea that their life is perfect or you know just because someone has money their life is perfect but what if what if it wasn't what if they were actually just a mess a mess of a person <laughs> so that was kind of the idea that sort of kickstarted Lena. And then I was thinking, okay, so who is this woman? And I was thinking back to like my sort of mid to late twenties, which is when I first moved from a smaller town to London, which is, you know, capital is like a huge city. It's got all this stuff going on. Um, and it, it's so hard. Like I had no money and you're living in share houses, you know, eating noodles and pasta because you can't afford anything. And you kind of always thought by the time you got to that age and had like a proper grown up job that you would, you would just know everything. You would magically be mature and, and have your own house, be married, have all these different things that I think, I don't know, like I felt like my parents' generation, like, they sort of had it all together and I felt like a bit like a failure. And so I wanted to try and capture that, that feeling. Um, but then have the sort of mystery um, sort of around it which sort of for me made just sort of elevated it and made it more fun because um, as much as it was it, you know you're thinking about this this messy person um, you know I, I wanted to make it fun to write and to put her into these horrible situations where she's just sort of like doesn't know what to do and often does the wrong thing usually something bad happens to her and she just thinks I'm just gonna go to the bar and have a cocktail like I just need to forget ignore ignore what's happening around me 
And so I found that really fun to just sort of explore this person who isn't stupid, but is kind of in denial about the way that her life has gone um, and drinks too much, smokes too much, makes friends with completely the wrong people just because they're more fun um, and throw her into this situation where it's kind of like survival. What, what does a person like that do? Um, and the, the honest answer in this book is most of the time she goes to the bar, but sometimes she does something a bit more sensible. Um, and I just find it real, like, for me, it was just a joy to write from her point of view because it's written in first person as well and sort of go on this journey with her. Um, and that goes into the second book as well. Like she's trying to find herself um, and her identity. So sort of creating that around the fact that she's mixed race but can pass as white. And she's kind of debating like, should I be passing as white? Should I be embracing my heritage? Um, when we first meet her in the first book, her father's just died um and he couldn't pass so she's kind of like am I denying my father there's all these different issues and things that are going through her head plus murders <laughs> so it's kind of a little bit crazy but um like I hope everyone finds it fun to read because I really find it fun to write mm -hmm. plus, plus murders just just that it sounds like a little too much to deal with <laughs> but fun yeah it's fun that as an author you know you're the first reader you get you kind of get a figure out what happens and that, that sounds like a lot of fun yeah um so i've got some more questions for our panelists before i get to that i'm going to post that link again in the chat there that's a landing page to all of our panelists novels and you can look them over if you want to buy one it'll send you to bookshop.org to, to pick one up um, next i want to jump into each one of your backgrounds a little bit uh, so madeline i want to start with you you have written several novels now about books um, the last bookshop in London, the librarian spy, and what, what's what's the fascination, and why did you make this kind of your thing? <laughs> so you know, the funny thing is, even some of my romance novels um, also have either somebody who's an author or somebody who's a reader, um, and and I think you know, just when it comes to writing books about books, first of all, I love books about books, um, but also it's just I feel like as a reader. Um, books are such a ubiquitous part of my life. They're they're just, I'm either thinking about a book that I'm reading, thinking about a book that I want to read, um, thinking something that I'm seeing in real life reminds me of something I read in a book, <laughs> or even something real life inspiring, like, oh, that'd be so cool to put in a book. So it really is such a big part of my life. And I say that I've always been a reader, but apparently my mom tells me that's not true. Apparently she used to have to pay me a penny a page when I first started learning how to read, but I don't remember, so it doesn't count. <laughs> um, but I've always just really enjoyed losing myself in a book. And so, um, and so a lot of times our characters do sort of take on some of our personalities. And in this regard, my characters tend to be readers. So, um, you know, with The Last Bookshop in London, when I wrote that one, I really wanted it to be like a celebration of reading. So believe it or not, I actually make the main character not much of a reader to start off with because she starts as she starts to really get a chance to start reading, she falls in love with reading. And the whole point of my doing that is, is that I really want people to remember what it's like to fall in love with reading because I think so many of us fell in love so long ago that we really don't remember it. And it's sort of like paying homage to that and, and letting readers really just kind of lose themselves in that. Um, and then as far as the librarian spy goes, I had read an article about how these librarians um, during World War II were sent from, um, from the Library uh, of Congress and New York Library into neutral countries during World War II to gather intel like pamphlets and, and reading materials that they could send back to be analyzed except these poor librarians really didn't get very much training when they were sent over there. So um, for those of you who know 007, Ian Fleming actually based his Casino Royale book off of the spy, of like his spy life in Lisbon. And so that will give you an idea of how consummate these spies really were. And these poor hapless librarians are just kind of like chucked over there like, all right, you got this. And I, you know, I thought, well, if I was ever a spy, which sounds super cool, but that would probably be me. <laughs> and so I thought that would be sort of a fun book to write. Um, and then, you know, with the Keeper of Hidden Books, again, just um, after reading about the the brave the brave efforts of those librarians, I mean, how could I not like write that story? It just was so incredible. So, and the next book that I'm working on right now, surprise, surprise, 
is also included uh, about books as well, set in a World War II setting, this one in Nottingham. I have to say, a penny a page doesn't sound that bad. Adjust that for inflation. <laughs> you can I know, make right? Quite a bit of money. <laughs> well, uh, Laura, let's go to you. Okay, art history is the butt of a lot of jokes, and I had to take art history as a freshman, and all I remember is this huge textbook, and being bored out of my mind. So, tell us about your mission to bring art history to to the forefront. Yeah, so I started out um, thinking that I was going to be an art history. Well, I really started out thinking I was going to be an archaeologist. So when I was, you know, like four years old and people used to ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I used to say, well, I want to be either an archaeologist or maybe a writer. And so I feel incredibly fortunate that I sort of became <laughs> what I thought I wanted to become when I was four. I think it just shows you the power of belief, right? But um I've, I went down the path of pursuing a PhD from Yale in art history. I had every intention of being an art history professor for the rest of my life. I taught art history at the college level um, in the US and in Italy. And I'm very sorry to hear you were bored. It was probably uh, <laughs> one of my beloved colleagues. <laughs> and you know, this is the crazy thing. We, the further we go along in art history, I think the more boring we make it sometimes. And um, you know, we, uh, there was a time I can remember sitting in the back of an academic conference and listening to um, one of my colleagues talk about something that was incredibly fascinating, but somehow they had managed to make it as boring as they possibly could. And I thought, something is wrong here because this is the most fascinating topic in the entire world. <laughs> so why are we making it so dull and inaccessible? And you know, it, that itch to write creatively that I had when I was a little kid sort of came back. And I thought, there's, there's got to be, you know, a way to, to break out of this academic kind of stricture and, and write creatively. And so once I sort of married my art history and my creative writing, that was when I felt like, okay, now this is what I really love and this is what I really want to do. So I think what links the two halves, you know, the nonfiction half and the, the fiction half of myself is, um, is that, you know, art history, yes, it's about objects, but it's really about stories and about people. And so it's really the perfect topic for historical fiction because art objects can go on incredible adventures and it's all about the people and the stories that surround them. And they're just some stories from art history that are so incredible, you could never make them up. And they make wonderful fodder for historical fiction. You know, I think historical fiction readers, including myself, we come to the genre often to learn as much as anything else. And, you know, the historical fiction reader doesn't necessarily want to get hit over the head with a textbook, you know, but they want to feel what it was like to walk down the street or smell the smells of the time. And so I think that, um, you know, art history, it allows us to learn about art in a way that, that we wouldn't like you, you know, sitting bored in a classroom. So um, it's really uh, fun for me to, to kind of discover these little stories. And, and, and like you, Madeline, I'm always like, ooh, that would make a cool book that is a great story, you know, or that's a really cool character. Um, and I'm constantly reading, you know, academic articles and these boring texts and finding things that I think are cool or interesting or would make a good story. Um, so that's really how it, how it weaves together. Um, right now I'm um, doing a summer lecture series because I can't help myself. I still love to teach art history. And so this summer, I've been doing a three-part lecture series called Looting the Uffizi. That's kind of the true story behind the last masterpiece. And um, so if you want to check that out, you can go to lauramorelli.com slash masterpiece. And there's details there. It's going to be open till through the end of July. So just a few more days. So um, you can jump in and, and uh, sign up before the end of the month. So uh, you know, there's there's so many incredible true stories that uh, demand to be told. So, yeah, I'm I'm so glad you're able to tell the stories behind the art. And I didn't mean to belittle art history. That <laughs> you have a lot of supporters there in the chat. So you're I'll not just... alone. Believe me, I've had so many people tell me the same story you did, <laughs> or oh, I thought it was going to be easy and it was so hard, and I had to memorize all these dates and it was terrible. <laughs> so I, I get it. 
<laughs> well, let's go to Logan. Logan, when you introduced yourself, you had a great tagline. I can't remember exactly what it was, but you said you're a litigator and I know you write law briefs. So how do you go from being a lawyer writing law briefs to writing fiction novels? Oh, that's such a big question. It is uh, it's <laughs> the question of my life for many years was how to kind of weave those two together. Um, so I've been a litigator for 14 years now. And um, when most people hear litigator, I think they think somebody who relishes the fight. And uh, you may have a sense um, by now of me that is that is definitely not me. I am not kind of your classic litigator. Um, I went into litigation um, because I like kind of the storytelling and writing aspects of law. And that is the place where you can do that. Um, and briefs uh, are basically just where you kind of put the story together for the court in writing. And so it's taken me, you know, my path in litigation um, has been kind of multi- yeah, you know, I started out at a typical kind of big law firm, um, clerked for several federal judges, uh, spent um, several years as uh, assistant U.S. attorney, um, uh, working defending you know the federal government and federal employees in lawsuits, and I've kind of worked my way into a brief writing specialist job, which is where I really get to focus on that storytelling writing aspect, um, which is a little bit more of a an at home place for me. Um, but, you know, it, it really, it took me some years of kind of that round the clock grind to get back to this, this dream that I'd had from a young age and kind of all through college of writing. Um, you know, I went into law, my risk averse self um, and my mom artist self um, told me to kind of, you know, go get a stable job, a steady job where I could, you know, work in a lot of different places. And so that was the initial draw to law, always knowing that I wanted to write on the side. Um, it took me a while to get back to it. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, it really felt like it was a tug of war. Like they were, you know, competing with one another. The, you know, I was kind of stealing away time for writing or, you know, stealing time away from writing for my law work. Uh, but over time, I've, I've come to accept it you know, number one, doing both means that my writing process is going to be a little slower and a little more plotting. Um, this book was kind of eight years in the making from start of research to now. And that's, that's kind of just me too, and, and how I work. Um, but the law really added so much in kind of all of that training to my writing experience or, or you know, complemented it in certain ways that I've come to see more now. Um, you know, it's, First of all, just a ton of discipline. Um, I the way I got this book written was by setting a daily minimum time goal for myself of just 20 minutes a day. So it was basically 20 minutes every day. I'm going to sit down and write um, at a minimum. And a lot of times that would kind of bleed into longer, but that was really how I got off the ground from having this this abstract goal that I really wanted to do someday to doing it. And a lot of times that was, you know, at the end of a 15, 16 hour work day, kind of adding that in, but making it a daily habit was really what got it done. And so much of that kind of discipline and structure was, was something that I, you know, was in my law training. Um, and then also, you know, so much of brief writing is not just um, kind of, you know, writing, but filtering out what matters from what doesn't matter because there's endless case law that you could pull into a brief, um, endless other decisions. And so you really have to be kind of a good judge and a good sorter um, and do a lot of outlining and planning. And so um, I did a lot of outlining and planning, which is by no means saying that's the only way to go about it. Um, I know there's kind of the plotter panther debate, but for me, you know, having an outline early on what in, in just starting out in this historical fiction writing process, that was such a good way for me to, as I was reading and doing the research, be able to pull in just the relevant pieces um, and kind of sort through in such a wealth of material about Ellen Montgomery, what um, was most relevant to the story that I wanted to tell. So over time have come to see how they, they complement. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense how you just described that. And I'll reiterate what um, Mabel just said in the chat there. It's about, dis you know, discipline. I th as for me too, like 
even if you don't, we don't, even though we love to write, we don't, we don't always feel like it, but even if you can just do 20 minutes. So I think that's great to hear you say that. And any uh, writers out there, aspiring writers, yeah, it's just about sitting down and doing the work, even when sometimes you don't have a, a lot of time to do it. Well, Louise, I want to ask you about music. Jazz is a central theme in your novels. Uh, why is music a central theme? I also want to know, what is it like for you to kind of describe sounds on the page? Yeah, um, I think when I was a kid, I used to write a lot. And I used to play piano, I play clarinet. So, so music and writing were always like my outlets anyway. Um, and then as I sort of became, got into my teenage years and then went off to university, I found other things to do with my time, like going out with my friends and those kind of fall by the wayside. But then when I started thinking about writing again, which is probably only about seven, eight years ago, I don't know, I think I was really drawn, but like, how do I, how do I go about this? Like, what, what is my inspiration for this? You know, cause I didn't want to write like a cynical book or, you know, especially for my first book, it's like, okay, what am I interested in? What can I sort of tell as a story authentically? And I knew that I really wanted to write um, about black characters living in London, um, but maybe at a, in a period where certainly a lot of British people don't even realize that there were black people in, living in the UK. So I was sort of looking at the 1850s and I started to do my research and I found, um, actually an African-American Shakespearean actor who had moved from New York to Europe because he couldn't get work in, in America at that time. So he came to Europe, he came to London, which is what this is where he's based, but he traveled all over. His name was Ira Aldrich. And he, he had three children and two of them ended up being opera singers. So I started just getting in this rabbit hole of opera and, um, cause I really love opera anyway. Um, and sort of finding out, um, the history of these sisters. And so I was like, I really, I really need to put this into, into this novel. Um, even though I wanted to use fictional characters, I didn't want to actually base them specifically on, on this family. Um, and that first novel, I finished it. Um, you know, going back to what Logan was saying about discipline. You know, I was literally getting up an hour before work and, and sort of writing this book. And it took me a couple of years. Um, and I made so many mistakes because obviously first novel. Um, and that's just in a drawer. That that novel never will never see the light of day in terms of publication because there were so many things wrong with it. But it really inspired me to think, OK, well, I've made I've learned all these things from writing this book. Um, what do I do next? And then I was looking at a book, so this is my first published book, which is called This Lovely City. And it's set in 1948 in 1950. So it's post-war London. Um, it's a period of history when there was a big migration from the Caribbean to the UK, um, because it's like after the war, um, the UK needed extra helping hands uh, because obviously uh, the country was devastated um, during the war. Um, and so I wanted to sort of look at what it would be like if you were sort of a teenage boy, sort of 19, who travels to London because you think it's going to be the city of your history books, because um, he's from Jamaica and Jamaica was a, was a British colony. So you had the British educational system and you were always, you were always taught in Jamaica and the islands that were sort of under British rule that, um, that London was this amazing city, the sun always shines. Uh, the sun hardly ever shines, so it's a complete lie. Um, and he gets there, and literally, within 24 hours, he knows he's made an awful mistake. Um, however, during the research, when I was looking at the ship they would have traveled on, there was a famous ship called the Windrush, which is one of the first ships that came. There were lots of musicians on board, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. Like, I can, I can really sort of lean into that. And because I used to play clarinet, and I was really into... Um, jazz um I sort of played around with that it allowed me to build a community around this character Laurie because I was like well he needs to be in a band so who are his band who you know where are they from where do they live um and it was just a really great way into um 
the story. So again, it's a mystery, but a lot of it is actually about the community and, and that that sort of feeling. And then in terms of putting music onto the page, it's it was quite daunting. It was really daunting, especially when I was thinking about jazz, because jazz is so dynamic. It's so it's so alive. You don't want to um, make jazz boring <laughs> by writing it really, really badly. Um, and I found, I was walked into a bookshop and on the table there was um, a James Baldwin book called Another Country, uh, which is now probably, if you had to ask me what my favourite book is, it would be that book. Um, and I've recommended it to so many of my friends, I've given it as presents. Um, and that is about a, a, a jazz musician and this community in New York. Um, and the way he wrote about music just really inspired me to give it a go and to like trust myself. Um, and to think about how I felt when I was on stage playing my clarinet and just sort of try and get that to come across on the page. So yeah, hopefully I, I think that that worked. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wonderful to hear you talk about the process. It really goes to show how much of ourselves go into these these novels and how much how long it takes and how much work is involved so good for you, mm -hmm. you. well our time is flying by so I want to invite our audience to start posting some questions just post them right in the chat um, I'm sure I won't be able to get to all of them but I'll sort through them as best I can um, I'm going to ask one more question of Madeline because I know it'll come up it came up in our little pre-meeting so Madeline tell us about your vision board or whatever it is you have going on back there <laughs> so this is my it's called a kanban board i think it's like k-a-h-n-b-a-n -A -A but basically this tracks all of my quarterly goals so the top is what needs to get done this quarter the well should be done this quarter the middle is what's in the process of being done and the last line is what is completely done and i was telling them my running joke is at the bottom is never as full as i would like it to be at the end of the quarter <laughs> Looks like you're getting a lot done to me. Thank you. <laughs> um, I see Kim, um, and I know she asked us earlier, what was each author's path to their first publication? So Logan, if you could start us off there, since um, you have a debut novel coming out. Sure, yes. Um, so eight years, as I said, from kind of start to now. So very much a long one. Um, I would say kind of the, the headlines are what you hear so often, which is persistence um, and um, also, you know, trusting my intuition. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, so often we hear persistence. I heard a, a writer say in a panel recently that success um, in, you know, being a writer, being an author is um, about being able to handle rejection the best. And I think that that is so much a part of it. That was definitely true for my journey. And that does not mean that I, I handled rejection well throughout, but I just kind of figured out ways to pick myself back up um, and uh, to be less alone in it, starting to share it more with other people. That was, that was a huge piece, but it took me a while to find an agent. Um, and yet I also kind of was targeted about that. So um, instead of just blind querying, I, I met an agent at a panel um, of agents and really um, felt like she would be such a good fit. And um, she talked about being really editorial and wanting to stick with authors through their careers. And she was young and entrepreneurial. And I, you know, I, I queried some, but I really um, worked to, um, you know, be with that agent. And that meant kind of a revise and resubmit that took a really long time and got me kind of deeper into the book um, and ended up in, in, you know, an acceptance with her that was one of the best days of my life. Um, Abby Saul is my agent. She's absolutely wonderful. Um, and then similarly, we kind of both had, you know, a sense we, we went to my editor, Tessa Woodward, um, at William Morrow, Harper Collins first with the manuscript um, with an exclusive and uh, but she said no. Um, another kind of really devastating, kind of hard to pick uh, myself up from um, pain point. And, you know, we kept going and Tessa came back um, about nine months later and said, you know, I can't stop thinking about that book. Can we have a, a conversation about it? 
and it was really by kind of opening the door to that conversation um, that I was able to kind of discover another another layer of this book and another layer of Maud's story um, that um, I hadn't gotten to yet. And that's where the birthday weekend themes were born for those who read um, the book. It's, you know, that uh, Tessa had the idea for a concise timeline with a very open-ended framework on what that timeline could be, but woven throughout the storyline that was there. Um, and it really helped me kind of mine deeper into Maud's story and I think draw out more for readers. Um, but I think so much of what, you know, and, and then even once we got a contract um, from, from Morrow, it was two years to the publication point. So there's a lot of waiting and seeing and persisting and a lot of hard moments and just kind of finding ways to pick yourself back up. And I think the biggest learn that I've had is to make writing a less solitary process than I initially thought that it was. I thought it just needed to be me out there on my own doing it all and to let other people in kind of selectively thinking about who in your life will be the best support, but that sharing um, and and letting people into the journey. Um, my husband and a few close friends have just been such wonderful support. Uh, that's been a key for me. Yeah, and, and that's part of being here today is being with uh, on a community of writers. Yes. Um, the questions are coming in fast and furious. I want to continue on what we were talking about, um, but I want to toss it over to Madeline and Laura, because before we started the meeting, you were both talking about having novels coming out on the same day and then both talking about having deadlines around the same time. But what was it like for you before that point? Because now that you've established yourselves and you have deadlines and contracts and just you're going all the time, um, what was it like getting there? Uh, Laura, if you could tell us your experience. Okay, sure. You know, we for me, we have to go back to the dark ages because I was first published in 2000, maybe. And so I started um, querying uh, agents in 1999. And so at that time, you know, that was the only way to get a book published was to query an agent. And so I was publishing nonfiction at that time. I was very fortunate to um, get a great agent and a, and a great deal on a nonfiction book. And I published um, uh, six nonfiction books, some traditionally, some um, I indie published um, when that became an option. And um, but my first work of fiction, um, you know, I too spent almost eight years writing my first novel. And um, while I was doing that, um, I was watching the market and seeing things just change dramatically. Um, publishing has completely changed since I started in 1999, 2000. And I was seeing a lot more opportunity, a lot more doors open for um, authors. And so when I was, when my first novel was ready, I made the decision not to query and, um, and not to share it with my agent and not to pursue a traditional deal. So I published um, three novels independently. And then um, I had an idea for a story that was partially set during World War II. And it felt as though it maybe belonged in traditional publishing. So I decided to dip my toe back in and see what that would be like. Um, I found an agent who was really working with these kinds of books and an editor who was buying these kinds of books. And so um, my last three have been uh, traditionally published with William Morrow, Harper Collins, and I'm under contract for a fourth. And so I really have come to believe that there are so many different paths and so many different opportunities for authors these days. It's just a fantastic time to be writing and publishing. Um, and I think that it really, the path to publication depends a lot on the individual project and depends a lot on, on the individual author and how you wanna pursue it. I'm very happy with eggs in many baskets. Uh, for me, that's the sweet spot, but everyone is different. Uh, some people really love being completely indie published. Some people love being completely traditionally published. And there are um, lots of new models now where um, authors are just selling direct to the, directly to their readers, um, which is working great for a lot of authors right now also. So there are just so many options, it's, it's great. 
And Madeline, um, it was how, so can you relate to Laura's experience there as yours a little bit different? Uh, so mine is a little bit different and that's the wonderful thing about publishing, right? Everybody does have their own totally different journey. Um, like Logan, I also went to school for something completely not related to um, writing whatsoever. Um, I majored in business administration with minors in economics, political science, and accounting. And I was a business analyst and um, I've written over 30 romance novels. So I was writing, I was, I was a full-time business analyst. I was writing six to eight romances a year and I have two kids. And for about four years of that, I was also a single mom. And so um, my running joke was that I was a full-time mom, full-time business analyst and full-time author. <laughs> so, um, you know, the funny thing is after all that, I, I was like, you know, I really want to switch gears and try writing historical fiction. But it was really hard because I didn't have any time, obviously. And then, um, and so then I finally, well, I ended up getting laid off from my job because they just kind of ran out of work. And I thought, oh, this is going to be so wonderful. I'm just going to be home completely by myself after like 15 years of writing. And I can just focus on this, um, this World War II novel that I have in my head. Well, so that was February 2020. We all know what happened a couple weeks later, the pandemic, and then the whole family was home. But I did still write my historical fiction, and that was the last bookshop in London. And um, and for me, you know, that made me realize that all of my history jumping that I was doing with my romances was really because I love the research. <laughs> so, you know, when I would say, oh, I'm tired of writing 1700s, you know, what about medieval? And then I would research medieval for a year and then start doing that and then Regency. And, and really with historical fiction, I really have found my niche because I really just love losing myself in research for like 10 months. And then I remember that I have a contract and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have two months to write this book. And then I frantically write the book. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how it's worked. And so now I've been writing full time for about two and a half years. And where I was doing six to eight books a year with a full-time job before, I am now writing one book a year uh, with my historical fiction because of all of the research that's involved. And now my running joke is that I'm a full-time mom with this little writing gig on the side, which my kids totally agree with. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, it's, it definitely keeps you busy. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Well, we could definitely um, continue this panel for a whole another hour, but I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, so I want to wrap things up here uh, before I do a couple quick announcements. So I've really enjoyed this panel. It's been fantastic uh, to talk to all of you and to hear about your books. Our next panel is coming up on Sunday, September 17th. I haven't posted any information about that, but if you follow us on Eventbrite, then you'll get a notification when that goes up. Um, we also, I'm also hosting an event on Friday evening. It's a uh, workshop, how to write history through fiction. And I'm doing a case study of the novel Booth by Karen Joy Fowler. It's just $10 and Karen's going to join us for a Q&A at the end. Um, so I'd love if any writers out there want to join me for that. Um, and then I always like to end these panels just asking about how important and valuable is historical fiction. So Louise, let's bring you back in. Why, why write historical mystery, historical fiction? What does that, what's the value of doing that? Um, I think writing fiction is just a really great way to um, bring the human element to an audience because, you know, as much as I love reading nonfiction, you know, I'm doing research all the time and 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 reading all of the, these um, biographies and and sort of factual information, you know, you can really touch touch the the reader by making it a personal story, and I think that's invaluable, especially when we're talking about difficult periods. It's sometimes hard to imagine that for yourself. So I think reading a novel can really help you put that yourself in that position. And Logan, how about you? Why why did you not write a nonfiction biography of L.M. Montgomery? Why did you make it into historical fiction? Well, first, you know, to be additive to kind of what's already there, there's, you know, her journals and a tremendous biography um, that exists. And this really allowed me to kind of um, explore the gaps in her journals and, and play with some kind of mystery elements there. Um, but I really, I agree so much with what Louise said about fiction is sticky. Um, for me, at least in my experience, it sticks with me in a different way than just reading straight history. And Laura, how about you? We talked about this a little already, but why why make historical fiction? What's the value there? 
Yeah, so, you know, whenever a student in one of my classes asks me a question that I don't know the answer to, I always say, I don't know the answer, but I'd be happy to make something up. <laughs> and it turns out that making stuff up is pretty awesome. You know, I, I think of, of historical fiction sort of like a giant 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle with about a third or maybe a half of the pieces missing. And, you know, you have all of these factual historical sources to help you anchor the side pieces in the corners and some of the the, the flowers or the faces or whatever, but you know, you just have so many gaps in the, the historical record. And I think that's where historical fiction can really play a role and it can um, sort of help imagine or bring to life things that we, we don't know. You know, we know that, um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa, but we don't know what their conversation was like in that room. And so historical fiction allows us to explore things like that. And I think it allows um, the reader to just immerse themselves in a time and a place. It allows them to smell the smells, to walk the streets, to really feel what it was like to live in a certain era. And um, I don't think many of us, you know, want to go back and live during World War II. But um, you know, through the the pages of a book, we can experience it and, and appreciate it and learn from it. Yeah, I like what you say about filling in the gaps. So Madeline, what's the value of historical fiction for you? Um, you know, for me, I've always really thought of like historical fiction almost as like the brain candy of a wonderful read with like an awesome little nugget of knowledge in between that you just kind of get to learn all those pieces as you go. Um, but I know that we're running out of time, so I'll just say one thing that I, it's not mine. Somebody else had said this, but I absolutely love it. And I think it's kind of perfect to close on is, is that, um, you know, history is what happened and historical fiction is how those people felt. And I think that that really at its core is, is kind of what we're all saying here is, is historical fiction lets you experience it in their shoes and live that life and see what it feels like. Yeah, well said. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to our audience, for everyone uh, for coming. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, Colin. everyone.